This is the Washington Week Webcast Extra. Hello and welcome. I'm Gwen Eiffel. I'm joined by Molly Ball of The Atlantic, Carol Lee of The Wall Street Journal, Manu Raju of CNN, and Josh Gerstein of Politico. All of them, oddly enough, currently or formerly employed by Politico. <laughs> There's a conspiracy theory we'll talk about later. But there are a lot of loose ends that we couldn't get to during the regular broadcast. First, Benghazi. Hillary Clinton may have won the political war this week, but is there still a legal war, a serious legal war underfoot, Josh? Well, I mean, I think the FBI investigation is pretty uh, serious. I saw that Jim Comey, the FBI director, used the word investigation in connection with it publicly for the what's first time this week. What's significant about the use of the word? Well, you know, there are different ways in the legal system these things are referred to. The first time he talked to reporters about this, he just kept calling it the matter over and over again. Oh. And there can be a preliminary inquiry and then a full investigation. So I don't know what he's uh, signifying, but mm -hmm. one of the shoes everyone's been waiting to see if it would drop is... Does that get converted into a full kind of criminal investigation, even if it, say, weren't focused on Hillary? Uh, would it be focused on people at the State Department who might have sent her classified information? Uh, barely broached at all during this 11-hour marathon, but a much bigger deal probably than this testimony if that investigation were to go in an unwelcome direction. Is that why the FBI was reportedly unhappy about what the president said about this? I mean, they did feel that the president was preempting uh, them in this, uh, I think it was a 60 Minutes interview, uh, where he said he didn't think this was a serious, uh, a serious matter or that it was a, didn't have serious national security consequences. Uh, that's what the FBI is investigating, and this comes up regularly. The president has done this in uh, the Bradley Manning case and a few others, mm -hmm. where he makes some kind of general comment about the way he thinks it's headed, and, you know, he's the head of the branch that's doing this investigation, so it would be better for him to reserve comment. And uh, we saw FBI agents and uh, others making that suggestion back to the White House on the front page of the New York Times. While we're at the White House, Carol, let's talk about something else the president did this week. He signed a def he vetoed a defense policy bill. What's the significance of what he did Well, or what he didn't do? Every year he's threatened to veto this, what's known as the National Defense Authorization Act, which sets, sets policy, um, military policy, but also authorizes funding for the military. And this year he did it, and he did it for his primary reason was because it didn't... Um, handle the budget in the way that he wanted to. He, want, he wanted um, an NDAA that got rid of sequestration. Um, but if you really look at what he's doing, one, he's setting up for a major bu budget fight. There's a bunch of deadlines that are coming up. November 3rd is the debt ceiling. December 11th, you know, the budget. Uh, there's a highway funding bill that, that's running out. So all of these things are kind of being punted to be dealt with some, somehow together. But at this, um, to me, I've covered the White House for six, seven years, and it's Guantanamo. This is his last chance to stop Congress from doing, from having the ban, particular, the biggest problem he has with the, the, the ban on detain, Guantanamo detainees coming to the U.S. And it's his, and that's, that is codified in this law, mm -hmm. and he's, it's why he's threatened to veto it in past years, but it ultimately signed it. And if he were to let that go through this year, it would tie his hands for basically the rest of his presidency, and he really wants that closed. This is one of the reasons why it's important to pay attention to things that seem obscure, because that's where policy hides. Let's talk a little bit more about the debt limit mm -hmm. ceiling, which it seems we are approaching again again and we keep approaching it again and, ki and kicking it down the road but this the first test is going to be in the house it is going to be it's a big problem for the house republicans don't have a solution yet I mean, now the white house is saying they just want a clean debt ceiling increase and what that means is that they don't want any restrictions tied to it they just want it increased and into next year probably actually into 2017 actually they'd take it as long as they could yeah. uh, but republicans in the senate actually agree they know there's a big problem politically. They're willing to punt this up until the beginning of March 2017 because they worry about the prospects of a debt default, which is the significance of raising the national debt ceiling. But in the House, they do not have the votes to pass a clean debt ceiling increase. Mm. So then what do you do? That's what John Boehner in his final week in office is struggling to figure out. They were supposed to vote today, Gwen, on a, on a bill to raise the debt ceiling that would tie it to a bunch of conservative policy ideas. But they couldn't even get the votes for that because they're, they're fundamentally a group of Republicans who will not vote for a debt ceiling increase no matter what's on it. So the question is, what, what can they pass? And there's not much time, and Paul Ryan's coming in office soon, soon, and he's going to have to deal with it potentially if John Boehner doesn't deal with it. 
And there's talk maybe of a short-term increase, but then they'll have to deal with it again. And the so, White House is poised to make this another big issue of, of irresponsibility on the part of the Republicans. Yeah, and, and I think this is actually probably maybe even a bigger problem than they've had in the past, you know, because a lot of these guys just, they don't, they're tired of caving on this issue. Um, and, you know, as Carol was suggesting earlier, there's another big fight right after that is funding the government on December 11th. And they need to figure out a way to deal with uh, extending government funding through the next year. And there's no agreement there. Yeah. Only thing different there is that there's actually talks happening between the White House and congressional leaders that are happening. But if, the, we're, if, if that comes after a default, who knows what resolution they can ultimately reach. Okay, Molly, we're going to take people inside the way we do our jobs. Uh, we had two candidates today run out of time, this week, run out of time and drop out of the race. Jim Webb, the former senator from Virginia, and uh, Lincoln Chafee, the former governor of Rhode Island and senator from Rhode Island. And um, you had set out to do a profile of Lincoln Chafee for the Atlantic Monthly's or the Atlantic's January issue, and then he drops out of the race. So... Tell us what you found <laughs> in your reporting that, in, in the end, didn't turn into the profile. Maybe well, it did. The, the, the piece ended up running online as a as a campaign obituary, uh, using the material that I gathered, spending a beautiful day in New Hampshire with Lincoln Chafee. I want. I went. I set out to profile him. Really, because if you look at the number of candidates, that's really one of the major features of this campaign cycle that makes it different from other presidential years. It's just the number of candidates. Yeah. With the number of Democrats and Republicans combined, which was, was 22 at its peak, it's down to only 18 now, <laughs> is the biggest field of candidates in 100 years. So why are all these people running? What has gotten into them? What motivates them? What are they thinking? Yeah. So, you know, Chafee seemed to me like possibly the most pointless of all the candidates. <laughs> so I figured I'd go and try and figure out what he was thinking as a way of getting into this whole phenomenon. And I really couldn't figure it out. And I think a lot of people had their first exposure to Chafee in last week's Democratic debate, and that was really the takeaway was, what is he doing there? What does he think he is up to? You know, I couldn't even get him to say that he thought he was going to be president. He didn't have this sort of arrogant, divine sense of mission that he just thought that he, he, he would get there. And voters seemed to get that he didn't really know what yeah, he was doing. Yeah, it was amazing over and over again on the campaign trail. People would raise their hands and say, I'm not trying to be rude, but why are you running? And he would sort of take it in stride and say, well, I've got this great resume. There, what, there wasn't even an issue. Right? A lot of candidates are like a message candidate, an issue candidate. There wasn't a single thing that was driving him to say, this is the one thing I've got to teach people or, 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 or impress on so people. It was if just, he, he just thought... If he didn't have a, a motivating candidate. reason for getting out, what, for getting in, why get out? Well, that's a good question. And if you listened to his uh, speech uh, getting out of the race today, it was just as sort of pointless and difficult to understand as the rest of his candidacy, right? There was this, like, weird analogy to to the Lysistrata, I believe, and then there, and there's this... He, he said, uh, I, I, I hope that a, a, a chance can be given to peace. Um, and, and, you know, in his announcement, he talked about the metric system, so his candidacy was just sort of wacky all over the place. And, and, and all over the map. He seemed like a very nice man. He did not some, seem like somebody who had any business being in a presidential race. Well, which was, there's something to be said for nice people running for president, but it would be nice if they were more than A block than of just granite 30. as well. Block he of granite. Repeatedly. I'm a that block that of was granite. my favorite when he described himself as a block of granite to describe his consistency. My other favorite is when our pal Wolf Blitzer said to him, you know, you're going to look silly if you keep doing this. Right. And that it was, was like, as a friend. a death knell. Senator Chavey, I've got to ask you. <laughs> Why, you're Why are you doing this? Yeah. Hear well, that enough times, I guess it finally sinks in. Well, let us know who you're profiling next, and we'll be sure to keep track and see who's about like to drop out next. Curse, curse. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you, everybody. There's more online on the Washington Week website, including footage from Hillary Clinton's last marathon congressional appearance in 1993. And the first lady at the time was defending the Clinton administration's health care plan. You can find that in the Washington Week vault at pbs.org slash Washington Week. And we'll see you next time on the Washington Week Webcast Extra. <laughs>